Hello, and welcome to introducing the Microsoft Zero Trust Workshop. My name is David Herster, and I'm a Principal Product Manager at Microsoft. I'm a member of the Customer Engineering Team, helping customers deploy our security products. And I've heard from many customers about the challenges they face in their Zero Trust journey due to the complex nature of security, particularly around how to start or what to do next. Now, if this sounds familiar, then this workshop is for you. So you can find our workshop at aka.ms slash ztworkshop. We've created a series of videos to help our customers run this workshop themselves and they'd be successful with it. This video is the first in a series that will walk you through all the benefits that the Microsoft Zero Trust Workshop has to offer. This first video will start with a brief overview of what Zero Trust is and then discuss some of the challenges customers face when implementing their Zero Trust strategy. And this will lead us to an overview of our workshop that you can run in your own organization. I'll discuss how, how you can get started with the workshop and the workshop tool and what your next steps would be. So with that in mind, let's get started with talking about what is zero trust. So navigating the complexities of modern security is challenging, but a zero trust strategy can provide clarity and direction. By adopting zero trust, your organization can enhance its security posture, reducing risk and complexity while improving compliance and governance. Now this approach leverages AI to provide robust protection and adaptability. As a result, a new security model is essential, one that embraces the hybrid workplace and safeguards people, devices, apps, and data, regardless of location. Now, at its core, Zero Trust is made up of three guiding principles. First, verify explicitly. This requires that you validate that the object attempting to access the resource is who it says it is. The object could be a human or non-human account. By having those objects verify who they say they are, you help reduce the inbound risk to a resource that would cause it to be compromised. Second, use least privileged access. Now, this limits the impact of a given compromise, uh, you know, reducing the blast radius, so to speak, by using just in time and just enough access. You only grant uh, objects the essential permissions they need to perform work. And when they require additional permissions, they need to request it. And this can all be audited and time boxed. Third, assume compromise. Now this is the mindset that attackers can and will sometimes successfully attack your environment, and you must be able to plan and respond accordingly. You need to be able to detect when bad things happen and to be able to respond and remediate. Now these three principles form the foundation of a zero trust security strategy. The concept of zero trust has evolved over the years, and it's not just a buzzword or a fad, rather, it's a standard that the industry with organizations such as NIST, the Open Group, and the DOD are coalescing around. Now pictured here, NIST has developed a notional zero trust architecture that covers areas such as identities, devices, data, and so on. Now, if we take this diagram and then overlay the products and services that Microsoft Security provides, it tells quite a compelling story. Representing the NIST area as gray boxes and Microsoft Security offerings in blue, this diagram highlights how our Microsoft security products and services span across all elements of the architecture of Zero Trust, allowing for you to secure all aspects of your environment. And while our breadth of coverage enables you to implement a very secure strategy, understanding where to start and what order items should be implemented can be challenging, even with one, within one element of the NIST architecture. Now, as you can see, your Zero Trust journey can involve many steps across a number of products. And while this may not be your journey, the point is that there are many different steps to take for each area of the Zero Trust architecture. Now, our Microsoft Zero Trust architecture describes the key technical components or pillars of Zero Trust, identity, devices, data, network, applications, and infrastructure. A key foundation of Zero Trust security is identities. Both human and non-human identities need strong authentication, connecting from either personal or corporate devices and endpoints, together requesting access based on strong policies grounded in zero trust principles that we discussed earlier. Verify explicitly, least privileged access, and assume compromise. And while representing a zero trust architecture as a series of pillars helps us understand the concept, concepts, there are still questions that you may have regarding implementation. Now, some common questions that we get asked include, where do I start? And what steps should I take towards achieving zero trust? Now, how many steps are needed? And what's, what's that sequence look like? and just understanding what's my overall progress towards my goals. So taking these questions and others from customers along with the pillars of Zero Trust into account, we've developed the Zero Trust Workshop to help our customers plan all aspects of a Zero Trust implementation. This workshop will help you determine what order to implement your Zero Trust steps 
and how to measure your overall progress towards your zero trust implementation goals. So our zero trust workshop can help you in a number of ways. First, it will allow you to measure your progress in your zero trust journey. It will help you, it will help you create a customized roadmap that will be relevant to your organization or team. And it will highlight cross product integrations and cross team collaborations that may not be considered by silo teams. And also it will help you to utilize the Microsoft security products and services that you already own today. So overall, the workshop's goal is really to help you improve your end-to-end -end security posture. Now that you're interested and excited about this workshop, the next question is, well, who should be involved in these workshops? When planning out a zero trust workshop for a specific pillar, such as identity, you should ensure that the proper stakeholders attend. You should have representation across your organization's security teams, including your zero trust lead, key enterprise architects, pillar specific architects, leads and SMEs, and members from your cybersecurity team as needed. Now, these workshop meetings are primarily discussion-based, involve cross-team and cross-product information sharing to complete the pillar roadmap. Each workshop's length varies, and they can take several hours or more to complete. So please consult our pillar-specific videos in this series for additional guidance around how much time to plan. All right, great. So you want to run your own workshop, and you have the stakeholders identified, so let's get started. So you should go and visit our website at aka.ms slash ztworkshop, where you can learn about and also download the workshop tool along with links to other resources to help you be success successful with your roadmap workshops. So review the workshop tool, assemble your pillar team, and schedule your workshop session. All right, let's review the workshop tool and how you would use it in a pillar session. The Zero Trust Workshop tool is an Excel spreadsheet. It is, an or it is organized according to the pillars from the Microsoft Zero Trust architecture with identity, devices, and data being available today. Network, infrastructure, and applications, they'll be coming soon, so stay tuned. Now, after you've downloaded and opened the workbook, you'll see the roadmap tabs at the bottom of the workbook. In this video, we're gonna be using the identity roadmap tab. Now, each pillar is broken down into sections, with the identity pillar has sections of apps, users and groups, devices, and operations. And each of these contain many roadmap items. So we're going to zoom in on the app section of the identity pillar roadmap and let's examine other features of the tool. The roadmap items are organized into logical horizontal swim lanes that are categorized. Now in this case, access, infrastructure, and authentication. The roadmap items are ordered into column groups of first, then, and next. Now these column groups help you sequence what roadmap items should we worked on and in what order. So we give you a first, then, next type of order. Now, as you prepare for your pillar workshop session, you should review all the roadmap items for that pillar. Each block on the roadmap is a hyperlink to a documentation page that we host to provide additional details and links to Microsoft documentation on that roadmap item. Now, in this example, let's click on the first item, Design Conditional Access Posture, to review its documentation page. Now this is the documentation page for the first roadmap item that we clicked on, Design Conditional Access Posture. You can see the left-hand side navigation allows you to go to other roadmap items across all the other pillars and not just identity. The center of the page presents an overview and detailed information about that roadmap item that you clicked on. This way it allows you to uh, get up to speed on that particular roadmap item and understand the context of what that item is all about. And this way you're prepared for when you have your session with your uh, overall pillar team. And then the reference section at the bottom provides links to Microsoft documentation related to this roadmap item, such as how-to guides or deep dive concept articles. All right, now that we've, looked, we've explored the documentation for roadmap items, let's go back to the workshop tool. So during your pillar workshop session, you and your pillar team addresses each roadmap item. So this will be you know, lots of discussion going back and forth and understanding, you know, where your organization stands uh, on that particular item. Now, as you discuss each roadmap item, set your organization's status using the dropdown. Selecting the dropdown next to the status presents you with a number of options. So you can either keep the default for the workbook, which is not started. That means the item hasn't been started yet. You have a couple different planning uh, items, either in planning or it's planned. Um, if you're implementing your plan, but you haven't completed it yet, you could say it's in progress. If you've implemented your plan and you consider it done, it's completed. 
blocked represents something that's preventing you from moving forward with your plan on this particular item. So maybe it's something, a prior roadmap item, or maybe some other external uh, influence is preventing this item from being uh, worked on. You have first party other and third party. Now these, this could either be a Microsoft product, which is first party, or a third party product that's already satisfying this item. You can mark this item as will not pursue. So maybe your organization or your team has decided you're not going to pursue this roadmap item. Uh, an item could be on Microsoft's roadmap. And so you're just going to indicate that this item uh, will eventually be incorporated in. And then lastly, uh, if you don't have enough information at the moment, uh, you can mark this item as follow-up. And then once you do have enough information, you can circle back, go back through your follow-up items and update the statuses accordingly. So in this particular case for design conditional access posture, the team has decided that, yeah, we do have a posture in place. You know, we have a strategy around conditional access policies. So we're going to mark this item as completed. Awesome. And so now the team will continue to address all the other work uh, roadmap items uh, for this particular pillar, uh, generally moving through the swim lane and then moving to the next row of swim lanes and, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's fast forward as the identity pillar team has discussed a number of these different roadmap items and they've set a number of different statuses for these items. So there may be situations where you want to add additional information about the roadmap item under discussion. Now, since this is an Excel workbook, you can easily add notes to each roadmap item using the native capabilities of Excel. So again, we're going to focus on that first roadmap item, design conditional access posture, and we'll add a note. So right-clicking on the roadmap item cell will pop open the context menu. Select new note, and a new note box will pop up. And your note, and you're ready to move on to the next item. So as you work with your organization and your team to complete your roadmap, you'll find that the roadmaps that you create become an artifact that can be revisited and updated on a regular cadence to help you visualize your progress towards your zero trust goal. All right, great. So you've had these great conversations, you've established roadmaps, and you can even see in this roadmap here that you know we kind of have a plan, we have a direction in terms of what we're gonna be focused on next and uh, how we're gonna make progress. So now that we reviewed the tool, let's look at next steps. So once you complete your pillar road workshop, you now have a roadmap detailing your current stance and what items are still left to be done. You can now take this roadmap and turn those future items into action items. These can be incorporated into your zero trust planning effort and as part of your organization's overall planning effort. A key next step is also to establish a cadence for regularly revisiting your, your zero trust pillar roadmap and updating it. Establish that cadence, establish a cadence that makes sense for your organization and team. Maybe it's three months, six months, or every, every year. And utilize the roadmap as an indicator of progress made towards zero trust over time. Lastly, begin to plan out the next pillar work workshop if you haven't done that already. All right, in this video, we reviewed the core zero trust principles and also discussed why implementing zero trust can be challenging. We showed how the Microsoft Zero Trust Workshop helps you with that challenge by providing guidance on the steps to take and the ordering of those steps across the Zero Trust arch architecture pillars. Lastly, we reviewed how you can use the Microsoft Zero Trust Workshop workbook in your pillar roadmap sessions. Now we recommend starting with either the identity or devices pillar as these form great foundations for future pillar workshops. Please check out our other videos which dive into each of the other pillars to provide you with specific details on each pillar's uh, workshop, along with some tips and tricks. In addition, we also provide a zero trust assessment tool, which you can run against your Microsoft Enter ID tenant to get the status of your tenant against many zero trust checks. We have a video for that too, and we recommend that you check it out. Well, once again, thank you for your interest in our zero trust workshop and good luck with running your own workshops. Thank you.